Thank you. My name is Margaret Crowley, and I'm here representing the New England Quinn QIO. Um, just to give you a little background, I was recently the state director in New Hampshire, but I retired technically in February. So um, not only do I work for Medicare, but I am a customer. Um, just like the Hair Club of America, I think, is what it is. Um, and I now have been invited to work with the main team on the long-term care project. So I'm here today as a pinch hitter to some extent. Um, our uh, task lead for this project, Sarah Dereniak uh, Dudley in New Hampshire, was to speak to you today about the Massachusetts work. Uh, but she uh, had a due date for a baby uh, today. Um, and actually had her baby two days ago, and so we're sending our best wishes to Sarah and her beautiful new baby girl. Um, and I also um, wanted to get a, a sense while we're here of who, I didn't get to see the hands for QIO folks here. How many? Okay, a few, great. So by way of background, I just want to share with you that I've been in um, the long-term care infection control arena since 1991, when I was invited to work with a laboratory who uh, had long-term care clients and wanted to be able to offer them some consultation services. To my good luck, the McGee criteria had literally come out the month that I started working. So I felt like I was two weeks ahead of the staff in terms of my knowledge base at that point. Um, and so it, it was at one point we worked with as many as 150 nursing homes uh, across New England. And I just want to share with you a couple of observations from 1991 and then come back to them at the end because I think that they, they show us some things about where we've been and where we're going. Um, let's see. Technology, when you get to be a, a, a Medicare recipient, I shouldn't be so stereotypical, can sometimes be challenging. So one of the things that we used to do back in 1991 was ask folks how they got to the job of infection control, uh, which was what we called it at the time. And um, the story went like this from many, many folks. Well. I was working as the nurse manager, or the MDS nurse, or the employee health nurse, or the quality improvement nurse, or all of the above. And I, it was Friday afternoon, typically. And I was invited into the director of nurse's office, or the administrative's office, who said, you are doing such a good job at what you're doing that I would like to offer you something else. And uh, that was to do infection prevention. And usually people were savvy enough to say, what does this involve? And usually it was, oh, it isn't very much. It's, it's collecting some data about you know how many infections we have. And then you would uh, go on to find out with some chagrin that there was no job description. And there were no hours assigned to the job. And there was no extra pay for the job. Um, and there was no stuff. And by stuff, I mean there were no resources. Um, because the person who was there before you had taken it all with them, you were told. Um, the other, the other uh, so that was one observation. The other one I wanted to mention was one that has been attributed to Lily Tomlin, which is, we're all in this alone. And I think that that was kind of the way people felt at the time. That it, and, I, and I saw it, too, as an extremely lonely job. Um, people were pretty much responsible for a program totally by themselves. Um, they had little contact with the outside world in terms of what went beyond the doors of the nursing home. Um, so. The reason that I bring these two things up, uh, let's see if I can be smart enough to switch slides here. Yes. Um, was that um, I, I think we need to talk some more at the end uh, of my presentation about where are the things and the resources and the collaborative 
folks that people need to do this job, both inside and outside their facilities. We've heard some wonderful ideas from folks, but uh, there's still a long way to go to make this job um, much less lonely. Um, so here's uh, what the focus is going to be. Um, we're going to talk to you about uh, some uh, potential partnership opportunities within your state for working uh, toward C. difficile prevention. And we've heard about some of these already, so I'm going to touch upon them lightly. And some methods for successfully working with these partners. I'm going to be talking about the Quinn QIO work on CDI prevention, some examples from New England, and I'm going to share with you Sarah Dereniak Dudley's presentation about the Massachusetts work, but also since I've been up in Maine since March, I'm going to talk to you about what they did up there too, because um, we have a couple of different collaborative partners, and both worked with the Department of Public Health. In Maine, the Department of Public Health is called the CDC, so it can be a little confusing. And um, in Massachusetts, they worked also with Tufts Medical Center, uh, and in Maine, they worked with the Maine Hospital Association. So this next slide is to give you just a very brief history of the QIO program. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, it, it's, uh, it, it will help to explain to you why you, you should love us and you should uh, welcome invitations to work with us. So most of you realize that uh, in 1965, Medicare came into being. President Lyndon Johnson uh, signed a bill making the uh, Medicare connection with the Social Security coverage, which had begun some 30 years earlier. And it was to provide hospital care, I mean, excuse me, to provide, yeah, hospital care, nursing home care, home care, and outpatient treatment for people over 65. Um, and what happened over time was various pieces of the program evolved. Some of you may go back a few years to PSROs in 1972, PROs um, in 1982. These were to look at things like the professional standards at the local level, look at the underuse or the overuse of Medicare. And um, really, the focus was pretty much on individuals as they came through the door, uh, looking at bad actors on, on an individual basis. And it was in 2002, and I, I always liken this to the, to the notion that, if you've ever heard this, he who pays the piper gets to call the tune. I think that Medicare realized at some point, this is how I see it, that they were spending more money on healthcare than virtually anybody else in the United States. And because they were paying for it, they should get to call a few shots in terms of how healthcare was performed. So it was at this point that there was a shift to look at um, more, um, more aggregate types of issues around quality of care. And that this is when they were going to have the opportunity to call a little bit, call the tune a little bit by linking payment of services over time to the quality of care. Uh, so um, the, 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 this was an important shift. And so the PROs were renamed Quality Improvement Organizations. Um, and this was to reflect kind of a multidisciplinary approach to looking at quality of care. It included looking at nursing care and medical care and all, all sorts of other care within these settings. I, I like to point out that the, what did, what did Medicare, what were they interested in looking at? Well, they tended to look at what was flowing from HHS at the top. <coughs> and you could probably sum it up by looking at these uh, quality um, metrics, which are, have to do with safety, effectiveness, efficiency, uh, patient-centeredness, timeliness. In other words, you can, you can do the right thing at the wrong time or too late, so we want to make sure people are getting the care they need at the right time. And finally, healthcare equity, which can have a lot to do with disparate distribution of services. Um, and so these are sort of the focus areas that we have 
when we get our con um, our contract. Um, I w my little sign that has the carrot and the stick, this is when I go out to see clients and I always say, well, we're the carrot people, not the stick people. Because what, what do I mean by that? We're non-regulatory. So I don't come in to regulate you. I come in to say, I'm from the government. I'm here to help. Um, and, and that really is the truth. My services come at no charge. We invite people to work with us on improvement activities that can benefit them and their patients. And we also tell them that we can be a preview of coming attractions. In other words, oftentimes what we're working on is something that's heading right down the pike towards you, so it gives you a chance to get it figured out before the pressure, the pressure is on. Um, so that brings me to our current work. What happened of, uh, with this most recent contract is we went from a three-year to a five-year contract. And also, you rem may remember with the QIO program that we tended to run by state uh, prior to this. So there were like 50-plus QIOs, including Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands. We consolidated. And we could combine ourselves into regional groups of up to six states. New England, I like to brag, is the only place in the United States that has a defined region called New England. And it's six adjoining states. And you can see that total uh, geographic area were quite small. I, I was talking with folks from California and Minnesota, and their, their states are probably bigger than our six combined. Um, and basically, each state has a full complement of QIO staff, but they were able to whoops save some money, um, some resources by combining services. So basically, I, I tell our recruits, uh, we go anywhere where there are Medicare beneficiaries. So where is that? We have usually work to do in hospitals, in long-term care facilities, doctor's offices. Uh, we, we're best friends with the ESRD network. We are um, involved with ambulatory surgery centers. We'll probably be moving into hospice going forward. This is some of the work that we've been, we're, we're in what, right now what we call the 11th statement of work, and we'll be uh, completing this in July of 2019, so our five-year contract. We're, we're, we're moving towards the end of the contract period, uh, but some of the work that we're doing in various settings, the other thing that we're doing this time, which is kind of unique, is we're working directly with Medicare beneficiaries with the Diabetes Self-Management Program. So we actually are working with, because Medicare is concerned, as they should be, that there is a very fast-moving train coming down with, with people with type 2 diabetes as they're going into their Medicare years. We want to look at ways to sort of slow down the, the serious consequences of that. And, and CDC is also looking at prevention of type 2 diabetes with their program. So, so how, can, how we can work with beneficiaries to help them come up with goals and plans to make small changes that can make a huge difference in their lives. Um, so you can see CDI reduction on here. Now, on this... Uh, Paige, you're going to get to see how we actually carried out what was our focus with our CDI project. It was already mentioned to you that we were to recruit 15% of nursing homes. The question is, what nursing homes? Uh, we were told to go after the high-risk nursing homes, but we didn't know what they were because we didn't have any data. Um, I, I need to back up for a minute and tell you that this whole invitation was based on, and you're probably all familiar with it, it has been alluded to, but earlier work done by the CDC that looked at the regions around the United States and looked at the extent of C. difficile, and what they found was that there was a whole lot more in the community in long-term care than they had previously expected. I think we all kind of thought of C. diff as a hospital problem, but in fact, that data suggested that there was a whole lot going on outside of hospitals. The problem was we didn't have good data outside of hospitals, so we, we were invited to help uh, with that issue. 
The other thing is um, I want to point out, so how do we pick those 15% of recruits? Because we didn't go out to every nursing home in our state to issue an invitation. Um, what we did was try to figure out, all right, if we wanted to find the nursing homes that have C. diff, where would we look? And I think this is kind of, uh, uh, this is, there's truth to this. I mean, it may sound kind of silly, but we ultimately came to the conclusion that we selected people who were guilty by association. So if they were parked next to a hospital that we knew already, we had their data, they were in a region where there was a lot of C. diff, that was who we went after. And I, I don't think it was a mistake. I think we didn't recruit all of them as well as we might have, and there might be further opportunities to recruit those folks. But that was our strategy in New England. So we enrolled those folks, and we hope to sustain their reporting over time. Um, and in addition to their uh, signing up to be recruited, um, we actually would help them with the enrollment and the uh, reporting process. We would train them in some other areas. Part of the program involved training in Team Steps, if you've been involved in that. Uh, we've had some wonderful success in long-term care facilities with Team Steps, doing separate modules of that. And this was on the, the communication uh, piece. And then finally, to help with antibiotic stewardship programs. So this is the Massachusetts Department of Public Health program that I wanted to talk to you about. And um, I, I, this was really based on Sarah Dreniak Dudley's presentation. And she said that she wanted to provide some practical insight on what uh, people were struggling with in, with NHSN data validation, for example, which you've heard about. I'll, I'll sort of zoom down to a lower level. Uh, wanted to talk about uh, how the partnership worked with Massachusetts. So what happened in Massachusetts is that they, they were partnering the QIO with the De Department of Public Health team uh, at the very start of the work. In fact, before the work began, uh, prior to recruitment of our NHSN cohort, with uh, HII work that we were doing in the hospitals, First of all, we realized there was an opportunity in long-term care facilities just because of the transitions of care in and out, that people were seeing the same residents. There, there was often uh, a, a disconnect between hospitals and long-term care facilities in the transfer of residents with uh, positive C. diff. Uh, oftentimes, there was poor communication. Long-term care facilities were not given the information of of the history of the resident or the current condition of the resident. So we wanted to look at improving that kind of uh, connection. And in the late summer and early fall of 2015, uh, the QIO partnered with DPH and recruited 10, 10 nursing homes to work in a 12, excuse me, to work in a pilot program, which included enrollment in NHSN. And uh, shortly after we got started with that, it became part of our work for the 11th scope of work. So everything kind of gelled uh, at that point. So initially, 93 nursing homes were recruited out of a total of 409. Um, and uh, after th there, were, there was lots of turmoil in New England. I have to tell you that. I've heard, we've heard lots of talk of this. We started to track turnover of staff, and we uh, came out around 75% turnover in um, in a one-year period. And that was specifically not the infection preventionist, who I think it was higher than that, but that was the administrators and the directors of nursing. So the pretty significant finding in terms of being able to keep a program going consistently. Um, there were also closures, consolidations, uh, various corporate groups becoming new corporate entities are being bought out by new corporate entities. Um, there are a few facilities that dropped out and who were unable to complete enrollment. So 85 out of the 93 successfully completed their enrollment and are now consistently reporting data. In addition, uh, 
not only did the facilities confer rights to us, to the QIO, and to the National Coordinating Center, which is the group that we report to, but they also conferred rights to the Department of Public Health so that they could have access to the data. And this eliminated any issues around data sharing. The DPH has reached out to all of the Massachusetts facilities uh, in the NHSN cohort as well to complete ICAR assessments, which you just heard about, and I'll speak a little bit about what we found specifically um, in Massachusetts. And the focus of our work also was on education, best practice recommendations, and validation. So uh, this is a slide uh, from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, and you can see that um, 123 nursing homes uh, participated in the Mass Department of Public Health long-term care ICAR assessment that was out of the CDC. And uh, NHSN enrollment and reporting education uh, was done by webinars, by face-to-face -face presentations. When we had multi-facility chains, we would go and speak to the entire group. A, a lot of telephonic communication. And I have to tell you that my strategy has typically been face-to-face -face meetings. You folks I know have long de geographic distances to go, so it's probably not an option, but I can tell you that any time that you do it, it pays big div dividends. Um, it kind of seals the deal, because I do think that once you've made a personal connection for someone, it's hard for them not to answer the phone or get back to you quickly, um, remember you when you email them. So um, if there's any chance of doing that, even once in the, in the time period that you spend with them, it's well worth the extra drive. Um, so, Here's some of the challenges we had. We've, we've heard about it already. We know lack of incentives is a problem when you, when you don't have to do something. <laughs> um, it's hard uh, when it's not regulatory. Um, so competing priorities is always an issue. Um, I, I try to be gentle and not bring out my lasso, but um, you know, lots of times I'm prepared to go to a meeting and and things change on a dime for folks. So I have to be, take a deep breath and say, hey, I know what you're dealing with. Um, as I said, staff turnover is huge. I think uh, just as a sidebar, we really need, we're, we're addressing this at least in, in each of our states, but we're not making great progress. We have staff, we have um, unemployment in, a, in New Hampshire, for example, somewhere around 2%. So everywhere you go, there are help wanted ads in Windows, and it, it just crosses over into healthcare. People had a hard time, as you can imagine, navigating NHS and SAMs. I think that we even had, uh, I'll make a note of this too, some folks had some pretty outdated um, equipment. Wasn't always the case, but they had outdated uh, computer equipment or they didn't have access to a computer. So those were challenges. Um, I can tell you it's better than it was in 1991, but we have a way to go yet. Um, so, th so the technology was literally their computer systems. Um, and you can see some of the solutions. They're great solutions, but they didn't always work. I can tell you in Maine that my desire, my goal to have multiple NHSN users, I'm happy if I have all of my homes with somebody who has access to the system, one somebody, uh, at, at the same time trying to uh, add other people. So this is uh, some of the first work that was done, and this was uh, some data cleaning reports that we did at, at the QIO level. We started to um, uh, look at, uh, rather than picking up the phone and having to email people each month, we put these reports together, our analytic team, uh, because we were starting to identify rep some reporting errors. And we thought that we could, we, we have a site where we can put the reports and people can go in and pull them up themselves, or we can bring them out if we're going out to visit a facility. And these were kind of some of the issues that, that they could easily see. There was a problem here. You know, you've got resident days and suddenly everybody's disappeared from the facility. Or you've got, <laughs> 
you've got admissions and suddenly there's no admissions. Um, that, you know, so these, this was, a, I think this was a very good way to start with people about quality of data, because this kind of jumps right out at you. Uh, that, that, uh, Houston, there's a problem here. Um, and then this next page was again looking at the uh, event reporting, um, not forgetting to put the check mark in the box uh, if there were no events. And you've heard that already, um, and not being able to then go on any further. So these were the, he, they, again, these were the top NHSN CDI data errors. Uh, overall, half of all nursing homes in Massachusetts cohort had at least one month out of 10 where there was incomplete or erroneous data from March to July. And uh, these are the top errors. So, you know, I, I won't repeat this, but these were highlighted on the uh, d reporting duplicate events, I think we've heard as well already. And then this, um, I was just given <laughs> hot off the press. So this is a state that was part of the uh, validation process. And they haven't finished all of their data yet. But I talked to them last week, and they gave me this beginning summary of their validation project. So um, one of the things that I wanted to point out to you was that you know they had a history of validating acute care hospitals. So they selected for this go round 20 acute care hospitals, 10 long-term care facilities to look at complete and accurate data reporting. And then they were going to, as, as you heard in the validation presentation, they're gonna, they, they, they went on site and they're gonna write up a report. But these were some of, uh, what they found. So they, they actually have done visits to the 10 nursing homes. And um, seven of the 10 uh, validations are complete. And of the seven, uh, six had missing events. And uh, what one of the things that they found, I think, was the main issue was people were overthinking <laughs> the measure. They really got caught up in uh, looking at status on the person before they got there and whether that now that they had C. diff, whether they should count them when they were in the facility, rather than looking at, I love Angela's quote, tell me if I got this right, Angela, but it was basically, what happens here stays here. So if it happened here, that's all I do to explain it to people. If it happened here, you count it. Um, but people, I think, overthink that, and they, they think that's too easy. Well, and that, that's what we want, easy. Um, so what we're finding was people were getting caught up in clinical data as well. Um, and there, again, we're going to get some more detail about this, but I wanted you to know that um, that's what they, they're seeing already. And they're going to start reporting, you know, providing a cheat sheet with the reporting algorithm and, and some fixes for this. So we'll be involved with that as well. And finally, um, what happened was, in terms of how did we use the data, um, we actually used it to create a, a variety of presentations or webinar, webinar events. Um, and these were the nine monthly webinars are listed at the top. Again, I mentioned to you that these were done in, in concert with Tufts Medical Center. They had a, an infectious disease physician who specialized in long-term care along with additional staff. So it was quite wonderful for us to partner with them in Massachusetts. And um, they actually even had conference calls where they could ask the experts or stump the stars. Um, so that was, um, and we also, uh, obviously, we measured uh, response to these programs and, and used the response from our participants to get ideas for additional programs as well going forward. So that is Massachusetts. And how many people here know that Massachusetts and Maine were once the same state? until 1840. So uh, Mass uh, uh, one of the things that is important to remember is that there is a day in um, Massachusetts you've probably heard of called Patriots Day. And it's April 
I think the 17th, that's terrible. And they had the Boston Marathon that day, but Maine also celebrates that holiday because they were part of Massachusetts at the time. So, a little trivia for today. Um, so this is Maine, and again, I, I'm, I'm telling you this as someone who's been a, kind of an outside observer. I did get to sit on their very last meeting that happened once I started working in Maine. And um, so what they had developed was a consortium of, or a, a, a collaborative, if you will, with, with three organizations, the QIO, the Maine Hospital Association, and the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, which we've been in close partnership since the hospitals started reporting, I think, in NHSN back in 2005. Uh, so it's, it's been a while. And what they did was uh, they, they realized that all three of them were doing some work on C. diff in NHSN and in a small state. What you don't want to do is find yourselves tripping over one another. That, that these folks have been in there half an hour before you show up. So there's some beauty to finding that out and, and coming together to work together on an issue. Um, and what um, we did in Maine was, uh, from the QIO perspective, we had 101 facilities. These, these numbers sound paltry compared to what I'm hearing from people from places like Arizona and, and California. We recruited 15 facilities. Uh, in, in terms of uh, hospitals, um, and, and we, again, this collaborative was a joint effort between hospitals and nursing homes. One of the things that we wanted to see is if there could be more coming together regionally so that people would understand the issue of C. diff in their region rather than just focusing on their facility. Um, I kind of look at this as the problem that Dorothy had when she was leaving Munchkinland. Do you remember the advice that she was given? She, they said, just follow the yellow brick road. It's like being discharged from the hospital. I don't know what you do with that advice because there were witches and all kinds of other problems along the way and nobody prepared her for that. They felt they'd done their job by just saying, follow the yellow brick road. So we wanted to make sure that those transitions went better, that we had warm handoffs with our facilities and told them uh, that this person has C. diff, uh, has a history of C. diff, et cetera, et cetera. So this was an opportunity to bring hospitals within a region together with the nursing homes in the same region. It was a six-month collaborative, so it was relatively short. But what we found was, again, and this is what I, what I came up with in terms of everybody in the state who was working on C. diff, um, that everybody had a little chunk of interest in this. The Maine Hospital Association, for example, had the HIN contract. So they were focused on the hospital solely in terms of preventing CDI. The Maine CDC, remember, is the Department of Public Health and they have their HAI prevention program. Their focus was on both hospitals and nursing homes. The QIO was us, we had our CDI initiative. And then the, uh, the hospitals and the nursing homes themselves wanted to focus obviously on best practices. So that was our, that was our gang. And the other thing I think that was important here for participants I want to point out is we didn't bring just the infection preventionists. We brought the decision makers and the people who are responsible for making sure that the IPs have the resources that they need. I think uh, I love to keep going back to the CLABC study because in that research where we saw that 70% drop in central line infections, one of the things that always stood out for me was that in one facility that they looked at, in order to do everything within the protocol correctly in terms of having the supplies at the bedside that you needed to put in that line, you had to go to eight different places on the nursing unit to get them. So invariably, you'd miss something. Um, and by pulling in administration and saying, we can't do this unless you're in on it, they were able to give the resources to develop a kit that had everything in it. Um, those things are hugely important, and I think it also says to the staff, this is important. Um, so having the, the directors there was, was crucial and the administrators. 
Th this is just some of the background for us. This is the background that you're all living with, which is the CMS rules that have changed and the conditions of participation. But we are also looking at this as a certain pressure on facilities to get these pieces in place. So we wanted to make sure that our work was aligning with what people were having to do in relationship to the conditions, uh, uh, to the changes in the rules for long-term care. This was our timeline, and they, gave, they began in January of 2017. They wanted to see if there was going to be an impact on infection rates. They weren't necessarily at the beginning looking at processes, but they ultimately did. Uh, yeah, to begin with, the rates in Maine are fairly low. Um, so, you know, they're pretty much everywhere. It's, it's under SIR 1, well below that. Um, and so I, I think we were more really wanting to focus on how could we improve infection control processes with this collaborative? Where were their opportunities? So you can see that they ended in April of 2018, but we're looking at some follow-up with folks. They wanted to stay connected going forward, and I think it was an important thing. So we're, we're going to be uh, probably having a reunion of sorts in September and see where people are because they're still working on projects. These were the areas that we ended up focusing on. So uh, uh, we, we focused on, for example, um, facility assessments. All those assessments that people are talking about today, the ICAR assessments, the survey, and NHSM, we wanted to make sure people were using those. Because sometimes I'm afraid that assessments become an exercise. And we wanted to look at how can you use this, the, the data here to guide your practices going forward. We also wanted to start thinking about the assessment that they'll be doing, the annual assessment, to set up their infection control program. And how can they use these tools and pull them forward? We, we brought up the issue, we, we added the issue of appropriate testing, and I'll show you where that came out, because I think it's been mentioned already. But there was a lot of confusion about laboratory testing uh, with C. diff. And what we were finding was that the, the diagnosis, the decision to test, all of those issues really had to be looked at because if you don't know what test you're using, there are implications. So uh, we spent a fair amount of time on that. Environmental services also include hand hygiene and environmental cleaning, and then antibiotic stewardship. And I'll talk a little bit about these. So the first session was on assessments, and they basically looked at a number of uh, assessments and, and conclusions that were drawn with uh, survey data, ICAR. They actually used some TAP assessments, the CDI TAP assessments, which were very helpful. Uh, core elements assessments, which were part of their antibiotic stewardship programs. And finally, participants saying qualitative data, I love it, right now I'm struggling with. Uh, th th those are all valid pieces of data. Um, coming from a qualitative researcher, so I have to listen to that. Um, so this is just some of the information, that, and it validates kind of what you folks are as well. You know, we, we, here, here's our opportunities. Uh, you can see on here we had opportunities and strengths. One of our great opportunities here was the notion that alcohol is the preferential treatment. Um, Sometimes I think it, it, it was a surprise to us because uh, folks, in, I think, in acute care have, 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 to, uh, have accepted that for some time. I think there's been a lot of conflict in nursing homes about, around the rules around fire safety, and so the message hasn't gotten through as well as it needs to that alcohol is the preferred hand hygiene method. And also, um, we were looking at uh, competency, uh, competency and validation on hand hygiene. So are we actually observing people uh, in terms of their technique, and are we doing auditing? Uh, again, that's a message that keeps coming back to us, but um, you, we want to become experts on the basics. 
This is, uh, again, the hand hygiene policies. Oh, you can see the star. See that? I, I didn't move fast enough here. Somebody made some fancy slides with stars that dropped down. <laughs> As if from the sky. Uh, this personal protective equipment, again, I bet there's some stars here that are, that are going to tell me what to do. Uh, no. Yes, there is. Uh, so, uh, you know, auditing, that was an opportunity. 81% said, no, nah, we're not doing that. Uh, and you know you've all seen it. You've walked by somebody, and they've got the gown on backwards, tied up the front. Uh, that was one of my favorites. Uh, or they, they have too small a gown, and they haven't tied it in the back, and so it's falling off them while they're trying to do their work. Uh, so, you know, you can have it on, but really, is it doing doing the job. Uh, and then uh, feedback regarding their use of PPE. You know, everybody thinks they're doing a great job, right? And then the antibiotic stewardship. Uh, they did, uh, they, they needed written policies. Uh, we've actually, there's, there's a lot of sample policies out there for people to start with, so that's great. And uh, a report summarizing antibiotic resistance. We weren't getting antibiograms in these facilities. Uh, feedback to providers. You are a high performer. You are not a high performer. Um, so, um, and then training on antibiotic use uh, and to clinical providers. This, and this was the gaps. Uh, you, you can see Maine next to the national here. You can see hand hygiene stands out for us. Uh, we had a strength on respiratory and cough etiquette. Thank you very much. Uh, so, but we're, it's pretty consistent. You know, we're, we're, we don't like to think we are, but we're like everybody else. So national data is good. These are the core uh, antibiotic stewardship core elements. You can see that in 2018, when they redid the, the they, they, they did much better. They've got leadership commitment and accountability. And at the end, meeting all seven criteria has gone up. So we're on the road. Uh, people do have a sense of what they need to do. And we've had some very good presentations from people out in the field who are doing the work, doing it well and has some great on-the-ground uh, recommendations for how to do it. And then uh, the TAP reports, this just gives you an idea of who we were able to capture in these data. And we had a total of, uh, you can see, 402 clinical people, 102 non-clinical, uh, which was good. And uh, one of the things that they found, by the way, when they did this was, um, and the non, uh, uh, many of the clinical staff put themselves in the category of other. And we went back and teased out who they were. So they couldn't hide under that one. Uh, and then this is what we found. And one of the major findings was non-clinical staff were in great, even greater need than the clinical staff. So you want to think about that when you're, you're putting your training together. That it, They were 20 points lower across all, all the various questions here. So that's, that was pretty significant uh, in terms of getting people on hire right out of the gate. And I call this a hands-up assessment, because how many people uh, are unclear about C. difficile laboratory testing? Uh, and it was 50%. That's pretty significant. Uh, and one of the things that we've done since this is the, the, our health department partners, one of the folks there is a, a laboratorian who is great, and so she she uh, and, and for those of you who haven't got this, you know, the Shea guidelines just came out in April of this year. They're an update from 2010, I believe, Shea IDSA. And you want to get those because uh, there are updates that are relevant around testing, for example. We do know now, for example, that testing for uh, the various toxins A and B. My understanding is they're a lot better than they were when I was in the lab 20 years ago. And um, there's also an indication if you're using 
the testing, the uh, nucleic acid testing, that you might want to consider doing a follow-up enzyme testing, although it wasn't a strong recommendation. Because apparently you can, this is my understanding, and I hope people will say something, I, is that it's possible to do, it's an incredibly sensitive test, it's possible to do toxin test, uh, nucleic acid, PCR testing, get a positive result, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's expressing the toxin. That's, that's okay, I got it. And so, um, you know, what, what we're concerned about is we're going to be over-diagnosing people. We also know that there's evidence that when people in long-term care are collecting that specimen, in some instances, they're not excluding people who have had laxatives for a few days or bowel prep. So it's very important that those things are handled, especially in the light of a very sensitive test. So you need to know your test and you need to know the implications for how people qualify for that test. So these were some of the outcomes. And what I did was, you know, one of the best part of, parts of this collaborative, and I got to see this because I had arrived in Maine at this point, was presentations done by the collaborative members, not by a group of subject matter experts, but the people who were doing the work themselves. And um, they were talking about what they had done. So, uh, you know, we had a presentation, for example, from an environmental services staff who talked about how they had employed uh, um, a process where they could start to look at how, how well they were doing in terms of reaching those high touch areas when they were cleaning rooms. And they started using some of the GLOW products to, to, as markers, and it was coming along very nicely. And it was good to hear from peers. Um, People started looking, for example, at antibiotics. What, what did they want to target? In this case, it was fluoroquinolones. We had a number of critical access hospitals uh, because in, in Maine, uh, large numbers of the 36 hospitals are critical access. They're, they're out, as we say up there, in the pucker brush. So they're, they're, they're out in rural, very rural areas. Um, that one hospital actually looked at all of their C. diff cases in the past year, did a look back and said they wanted to focus on, you know, who were these folks, what were their risk factors. They wanted to share a report with the physicians on who they'd been treating for the past year. They looked at things like committee attendance, who was serving on the antibiotic stewardship committee, who needed to be added to that committee. Um, they, they, they moved into SBAR communication with physicians in long-term care so that when they called the physician up and gave their SBAR communication that they had a little bit more control over the conversation and perhaps over the outcome. Um, and so these are just some examples. I'm, I'm not going to go into detail. I just wanted to show you that there were a variety of things that people chose to work on based on the assessments that, that we sort of fed back to them, and they looked at them with fresh eyes. Um, under facility assessment, they looked at plans for follow-up from various assessment ele elements. Uh, that hand hygiene monitoring came out of that, and the environmental services monitoring. Um, Environmental services, what times was a big thing? And I understand this has become a big thing, at least in New England, with state surveyors, that they're going around when they come in and asking people, uh, you know, you say the wet time for that product is five minutes. Is it okay if it dries out in two? And people are saying, yeah, that's fine. And so they're getting socked on that one. Um, so that's the question of the day. People like to talk at statewide conferences about, you know, they're one step ahead of the surveyors. What's the big question out there right now? Do they, they probably do that in all of your states, but that can be very useful. Um, so uh, this was, uh, again, uh, C. difficile testing, some of them looked at their protocols, they were going to go back, talk to their physicians, present the new literature on testing. Uh, and, and one of them, uh, hospitals had physician mandatory training on uh, C. difficile testing. Uh, so the data, in terms of looking at outcomes, again, we're talking from uh, 
a short period of time, there were no differences in the numbers. But I think, again, we, were more, we ended up being much more focused on the processes. There's going to be further follow-up looking at the numbers. Uh, so as, as a final, some final thoughts, I think what we, we realized when we started that to partner successfully, uh, you know, you have to clarify what your goal is. Where do we want to get to at the end of this so that everybody was on it? the same page. But they had a lot of meetings with just the members of the collaborative to talk about uh, where things were going. Uh, so expose what your individual agenda is at the beginning. You know, what is it that you're being charged to do under your contract, and how can we all get this to work coming in together? Uh, what, what can a partnership do that you can't do alone? Uh, the right people, and I think we had the right people by bringing in both the administration and the, and the direct care staff. Supporting each other's learnings really had to do with, I think, pulling in the participants from the long-term care facilities along with everybody else to do the training. And then, uh, it, so that was also recognizing all sources of expertise. And that, my friends, is the end. Thank you very much. And I'm happy if anybody has any questions, I'll try to answer them. Are there any, are there any questions for Dr. Crowley? Margaret, I just want to say that was awesome. It's so cool to hear how much you all have accomplished in, in New England and also um, real concrete examples of how your providers have benefit from the outreach, the education, and just the technical support that y'all are providing. Um, I wanted to just make a comment uh, because uh, I thought it was really interesting how close the data you showed from your infection control assessment work and what we have seen sort of yes. at the national level and um, make the point um, that a lot of these assessments were done around the time that the proposed requirements for stewardship had come out, but before uh, the November 2017 implementation deadline had come into effect. And I think you really made a nice point of how much improvement you've seen as a result of the requirement and the work that everybody's been doing to get stewardship in place. And I think the states are able to look at progress over time and look at you know what the domains early on in your assessment work look compared to the findings later in time. And we don't have that opportunity at the national level, so we just sort of see all the results no matter when they occurred. And I think the efforts of the requirements coupled with the education and the outreach from the health departments really did help providers get more in place over time. And I think people are in much better shape if they were working with groups like yours. Um, and I also think um, this, issue of auditing practice at the bedside and providing feedback in real time or in, in routine um, reports to staff is something that uh, we don't necessarily, we haven't been talking about for long-term care as much as we have in acute care. Mm -hmm. And I know, again, that the lack of staff resources to do infection prevention is going to impact how much we can actually implement that practice. So the fact that outside partners are coming in and doing some observations and giving that data back, it's a starting point for you to then work on and use those tools and right. develop with your staff those kinds of uh, programs. Thanks. I, I also, you, while you were talking, I remembered that I wanted to come back on those two issues that I brought up at the beginning, which I didn't do. And that is that a number of people have mentioned various topics here that I think, um, again, we can really work with our infection preventionists to give them the resources and the collaborative partners that they need. I'll give you one example. I've had facilities say to me, you know, my, my laboratory won't, so they can't do a, uh, an, an antibiogram for, for me. Well, I did antibiograms for 150 nursing homes back in 1991. I am sure they can do antibiograms. They have computerized systems that will create an antibiogram. So I've actually said to facilities, talk to your administrator about the possibility of, of, of saying, you know, you might consider looking at a different reference laboratory going forward. Because they have a capability of sorting out 
who has to pay for the test. They can figure out who the test belongs to facility-wise, I would think, if they chose to. So I would push for that. And the other thing I would push from the laboratory is to get a monthly report of all cultures that are performed for a summary report for the infection control people. They should be able to get that. And if you get reports coming in over a report printer, we were able to sit, automatically print two copies of the report, and one of them said at the top, for infection control, so that you got reports daily of all the, the data that was coming into your facility. I think those are important asks. And uh, you, know, you have to sometimes be a little squeaky wheel on that stuff. The other thing is the issue of collecting data like total patient days and total admissions. Or, you know, the business office has that stuff. And if they tell you they don't, you need to go to the administrator and say, I need some support for this from the business office. You can prepare a little sheet for them that has what you want every single month and say what date you want it by, and they should be able to send that right over to you. So finding those internal collaborators, you know, training. Yeah, one of the models that was used in, in hospitals, and I think it would have great great opportunity in long-term care is the notion of having sort of eyes and ears or disciples on each floor. So I always tell long-term care people, especially in larger facilities, where you might have a lot of new young nurses, find some new young crackerjack that is interested in, in deciding a career in infection prevention and control and tell them you're going to train them to be your disciple. And they're going to work on that unit to help, because you can't be there, right? And they're going to be your eyes and ears when you're not there. I think these important mentoring uh, opportunities are going to be a great opportunity to expand yeah, yeah, we're not all in this alone anymore, right? So that's what we want to hear. Thanks.